Hi guys, welcome back to our first series on chemical reactions. So far we have looked at the ways in which metals react by exploring the inner workings of a blast furnace. We've also looked at how we can represent the chemical changes or reactions that we see by writing balanced chemical equations. At the end of the last lesson, I gave you quite a challenging task. Let's check out this reaction of iron 3 oxide and carbon monoxide. So, iron 3 oxide is written as Fe2O3. Carbon monoxide is written as CO. Iron has the symbol Fe and carbon dioxide is CO2. Next, we check to see if the equation is balanced by counting the number of atoms of each element that act as reactants and the number of atoms of each element in the products. It is always a good idea to record this type of data in a table. Here is mine. As you can clearly see, this equation is not balanced. We don't have the same amount of atoms of any of the elements at the start and end of this equation. The law of conservation of mass is not obeyed. OK, so how do we fix it? Remember, the one thing we cannot do is to change the formula of any of these substances. The only thing we can do is to show that a different number of molecules are reacting. We do this by writing a number in front of the formula. At first glance, it looks like we need to double the number of oxygen atoms in the product by placing a 2 in front of the CO2. Now there are four oxygen atoms on each side of the equation, but this has caused the number of carbon to change to 2 as well. To balance the carbons, now I need to place a 2 in front of the CO. But this changes the number of oxygen atoms again. This strategy is obviously not working. Let's start again. Have a careful look at the oxygen atoms on the left hand side. Notice that the oxygen atoms are found in two compounds. Three with the iron and one with the carbon. On the right hand side, the oxygen atoms are only found in the carbon dioxide. Since carbon dioxide is CO2, there will always be an even number of oxygen atoms in the product. This means we need to find a way to get an even number of oxygen atoms on the left hand side. This was the hint I gave you at the end of the last lesson. If we add three carbon monoxide particles, this means that there are now six oxygen atoms on the left hand side. And to balance this, I must write a three in front of the CO2. 3 times 2 is 6. See, the oxygen and carbon atoms are now balanced. What about the iron? There are two atoms of iron on the left and one on the right. Balancing this is easy. We just write a large 2 in front of the Fe. This gives us a balanced chemical equation that represents the chemical change taking place inside the blast furnace. Even though that was quite tricky, I'm sure you got the right answer. We will be practicing the skill of writing balanced equations throughout the series, so don't forget these two golden rules. Never change the formula of a compound and always check that the number of atoms of each element before the reaction is the same as the number after the reaction. Now, in today's lesson, we will continue our journey through the world of metals by finding out a little more about their physical properties. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify the physical properties of metals and explain how the microscopic model of metals can be used to explain these macroscopic properties. When we set out to learn things in the physical sciences, we do not have to only look at books. Most of our scientific knowledge has been developed through conducting experiments. In this lesson, we will conduct a few simple experiments to investigate the physical properties of metals. Remember to get ready to record your observations so that you can make conclusions later. First, 
we will compare what happens when we bend a piece of metal and this plastic ruler which is made from a non-metallic compound. Let's have a look. We will start by bending this piece of plastic. Do you notice that the plastic only bends a little and then it breaks? The plastic ruler is not flexible. Now let's bend the piece of metal. Can you see that the metal bends very easily and that it doesn't shatter? What conclusions can we draw about metals from the results of this experiment? Why don't we start a list to record the metallic properties that we discover during this lesson? The first property of metals that we observe from this experiment is that it bends easily. We say that metals are flexible. For our next experiment, we will take some zinc, which is a metal, and a lump of yellow sulfur, which is a non-metal, and gently hammer them. Can you predict what will happen? Look carefully at how the metal flattens when I hammer it. Now watch what happens as I hammer the sulfur. Do you see that the substance shatters into small pieces? We say that this non-metal is brittle. So a property of metals is that they can be hammered flat or rolled into a sheet. We say that metals are malleable. Malleable is the ability of a metal to be flattened into a sheet or molded into a shape by hammering. Metals can also be drawn into a wire. You can see this by looking at the copper cables used to conduct electricity. To describe this property, we say the metal is ductile. Ductile is the ability of a metal to be drawn into a thread. Let's add these observations to our list of physical properties of metals. From our experiments and observations of the world around us, we can conclude that metals are malleable and ductile. In the next experiment, I want us to observe what happens to the light bulb in this electric circuit board when we place a metal strip into the circuit board. And then we will look at what happens when we take out the metal strip and replace it with our plastic ruler. When we switch on the circuit board while the metal is connected to the testing wires, the light bulb goes on. This means that metal conducts electricity. If we repeat the experiment with the plastic connected to the testing wires, the light bulb does not shine. This indicates that plastic, which is made from non-metallic substances, does not conduct electricity, but instead acts as an electrical insulator. Metals also conduct heat well. We say that they are good thermal conductors. That is why pots and pans are made of metal. Just look at how quickly the butter melts as soon as heat is applied to the pan. While we are talking about heat, how do you think the melting point of metals compare to the melting points of plastic? Let's have a look at our next experiment to see if we can find an answer. Observe what happens if we place this metal strip in the hottest part of the flame of a Bunsen burner. Can you see that the metal starts to glow a little, but retains its shape? Do you notice that if we repeat this experiment with the plastic spoon, the plastic starts to melt almost immediately and loses its shape? From these results, we can conclude that this metal has a much higher melting point than plastic. Before we continue, let's add our observations to our list of the physical properties of metals. So far, we've observed that metals show the following properties. Metals are flexible, malleable and ductile. Now we can add that metals conduct electricity, conduct heat and generally have high melting points. Because of their physical properties, 
Metals are used to make a range of different objects that make them very useful in our daily lives. But what gives metals these special physical properties? To find the answer, we need to look at the metallic bonding model scientists have developed. We need to establish a link between the macrophysical properties and the microscopic arrangement of particles inside the metal. Let's have a closer look. Inside any sample of metal, the metal atoms are arranged in a flexible lattice. The metal atoms have a large atomic radius and so the outer electrons are very loosely held. In fact, these electrons can drift from one atom to the next. Now, when an atom loses an electron, it becomes a positively charged ion. This means that inside a metal, we have an arrangement of positively charged ions surrounded by moving loosely held electrons. The forces of attraction between positive ions and the electrons acts like a glue that holds the metal in its special bond. This microscopic model of metals can help us explain the physical properties we have discovered. Have another look at the arrangement of positive ions and the free moving electrons. Notice the particles are not held in a fixed regular structure. The forces of attraction between the particles are strong but act in more than one direction. When a force is applied to the metal, the shape of the lattice may change but the forces of attraction still keep the particles together. So, the model can be used to explain why metals are flexible, malleable and ductile. The fact that there are lots of strong forces holding the lattice together means that a lot of energy would have to be applied to this lattice to make it break up. This explains why metals generally have high melting points. Now, for your task today, I want you to use the microscopic model of the metallic bond to explain two important properties of metals we have discovered. Use the metallic bond model to explain why metals are good electrical and thermal conductors. To help you with your task, I can give you two tips. One, you should know that electrical conductors allow charge to flow. Secondly, you must remember that when the temperature increases, the kinetic energy of particles increases too. The metallic bonding model has helped us to explain the physical properties of metals, but it will also help us to understand their chemical properties. So, join me for lesson 3, where we begin to look at the chemical properties of metals. See you then. Goodbye.